The Next Chapter with Prim Sarupapad is a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, everybody, it's Prim. Welcome to The Next Chapter presented by Baron Davis and Slick Studios. This week's guest is yet another dear friend of mine, a former D1 and pro tennis player turned stand-up comedian who is currently a correspondent on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Michael Costa. So Costa, whom I obviously refer to by his last name, was a really gifted athlete and tennis player. He and I have known each other since high school because we both went to the same tennis academy in Tampa, Florida, Saddlebrook. After high school, he earned a full ride to the University of Illinois, where they won four Big Ten championships during his time there from 1998 to 2002. And the team actually ended up winning their first NCAA title around that time. So for those that don't know, especially within the college tennis landscape, during that period in the early 2000s, the Illinois men's tennis program was highly regarded as one of the best programs in the country. Now, after college and after a couple of years trying to play professionally, Michael eventually transitioned to the world of comedy. And it has been wild to see how far and how high he's gone. Now, over the course of his impressive career, he's appeared on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, Chelsea Lately back in the day, The Late Night with Seth Meyers. He's also starred in his own Comedy Central special, performed all over the country. And today, as I said, he is a correspondent for The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Now, heading into this interview, I was really curious about why and how he got into comedy, because you don't often hear of a lot of athletes getting into this industry, at least not as a full-time gig. So in this interview, we unpack a lot about the struggles he endured leaving the game of tennis and what drew him to comedy and the stark similarities between what he did as a tennis player and what he does today as a stand-up comedian. And through Michael's story, one might be able to see just the bigger picture of how one chapter in a person's life, in this case, Costa's journey as a tennis player, might act as the warm-up because it's essentially preparing the person for what they were truly meant to be. And it's a theme that I can really identify with because the further along I go in my career and in life, I often wonder if tennis was really just a setup for all of the successes and things that I am doing today. So get ready for an insightful and fun and thoughtful conversation. And of course, with some laughs, Here's Michael Costa. We're going to start off with some rapid fire. Um, yeah. I know, okay. did that... Did that bring up a little anxiety? No, I like a, I like a, uh, I like when things get going. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, I like it. It's like a, it's like let's do it. I like that. Yeah, there's no warm up. There's there's yeah. no warm up, and yeah. this is kind of like improv. So you should really be used to this. Okay, okay, three words that described you as an athlete. As an athlete, competitive, um, effort, and bluff. Bluff? A little bit of a bluff. Come on. A little bit of a charge the net and hope that they made a mistake instead of <laughs> if they made me play two volleys, they pretty much want the point. You know what I mean? That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Favorite sport growing up? It was tennis. Okay. Tennis. Yeah. Favorite athlete growing up? Mm, mm, mm. Joe Dumars. Okay. Play piston, not maybe the star of the Pistons, but this this unsung, quiet, unbelievable competitor, and who just like would just keep his mind and eyes focused. All right, very nice. Uh, favorite team growing up, sports team? Probably the Michigan Wolverine basketball team. Oh yeah. Fab Five, yeah. Yes. Okay. I was about to say um, yeah. 80s, 90s, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Your strength as an athlete. I would say 
overall, uh, man, this is good. Cause all I've been thinking about is comedy the last 20 years. So this is like, holy shit. What was my com- athletic strength? Just general start to finish competitive level. Yes. Does that, does that like make sense? It, it does. Okay. It does. What about your weakness? I would say technically no real weapons and, and, uh, emotionally, uh, could get tight, you know, like yep. in big points, I, w- I would overthink it mm. right here. Yep. Favorite, uh, <laughs> <laughs> explains a lot about how far I got into my career, favorite and best moment as an athlete. My favorite moment was when I got my first ATP point. Probably that was just really, really, really was like solidified so much for me. And then favorite. And and you said, what was it? Yeah. Just favorite and okay. or best moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's probably my favorite. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the the match? The moment? Yeah. In the match? I mean, it was a crazy day and I'll just give you a brief synopsis. Um, my, friend Graydon Oliver said actually right before my first match can you drive my girlfriend's car and she's going to go with me blah 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 so we're going like an hour on the highway and a truck crashes into me okay oh a truck makes an illegal u-turn and we crash into each other and I have my match time my first ATP match the police officer shows up taking and I'm like I have to go I have to go I have to go so I I go down in a different car. My Graydon's girlfriend is crying because sadly she lost her mom in a car accident. So I'm like oh sitting gosh. in this car. It's like everything's worse. I show up 25 minutes late. I lose the toss. I lose the first three games based off of default. I'm playing Jack Brazington, a University of Texas star. I've got a sore back and neck. Actually, I think the best thing that ever happened was this car accident because it just got my head like... Loose, yeah, like, you know, and I end up playing amazing and winning. What? No way. Yeah, very strange. That's an okay. unbelievable story. Oh my yeah. gosh. So it was like a little bit of a testament of like just being competitive. Doesn't matter what happens to you. Just f- figure out a way, and and that's w- one of my favorite moments. Yeah. What's the funniest moment you ever had as an athlete? Oh man. Probably multiple. Sicknesses in Mexico, Korea, being on the other side of the city, just trying to talk to a taxi driver you don't speak the same language of. Um, <laughs> those aren't they're funny now. I was because gonna say, I, everything's okay. Funny. But you know, the 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 minor league pro tennis grind has just got so much opportunity for for comedy, both intentional and unintentional. Yes. Worst moment as an athlete. In Korea, I was having a really hard run of tournaments and I finally figured some stuff out and I was up 5-1 serving in the third in the first round of a uh, event and I choked the whole match away. And I still, I still, Prim, I'm 42 years old. I have a different career, a family. I still dream about the match. Are you serious? Yes. What was it about that match other than the obvious choking? But yeah. why? Because we've choked. We've all yeah. choked multiple yeah. matches. Yeah. So why that match, though? Well, it was toward the end, too. It was I was feeling like I hadn't, you know, I was reaching the end of this mountain, which, you know, I know you know a lot about. And it was kind of like, what have you really done? And And you start to get really hard on yourself. And you hear you went to Korea for three weeks and you didn't even pick up a point. And you finally was like, OK, good. You got it. You've, you've, you've at least solidified this match. So, of course, I made it bigger than the match. It was my life and my personality and my success as a human. And, of course, that's when it all, you know, goes terrible. Wow. Um, And last rapid fire, one activity hobby uh, that you do now that replaces the feeling of sport or being an athlete. I definitely would say stand up comedy for sure. It's not physical, but the same reward system is activated when it all goes well. I had a feeling. You were going to say that yeah. because I, I feel the same way about sports broadcasting and yeah. reporting and journalism, yeah. the aspect yeah. of like live TV, the performative yeah. aspect. Yeah. So going back stepping to stepping up, stepping up yes. in a moment, in a difficult moment and in, in achieving and doing well makes you feel very good. And then there's the other side of it, the dark side of it, which we don't love, but 
there is that adrenaline rush because it's live. So if you bomb, not not only do you bomb, but you bomb in front of everybody on a large stage. And I kind of, I kind of have a love hate relationship with that. How do you, how do you feel? Well, yeah, it's, there's, there's real stakes. So it's exciting because there's something to overcome and there's something, there's an achieve. Yeah. There's stakes. Um, you know, I, in comedy, when you bomb, I bombed last night, actually hard comedy. When you bomb, it's so personal because it's, it came from your soul. You wrote it. Uh, and in a lot of ways I feel like it hurts more in tennis. When I bombed lost badly, whatever you kind of like, well, part of it's my opponent played pretty good. So <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of part of it's like, well, I can't really control too much of that. It's not, I was prepared and I tried, but in comedy, it's like they have rejected not only your performance, but you and your words and your thoughts. Yes. I think that's why I love comedy so much. You yeah. and I got a chance to catch up for the first time in years. Yeah. And I don't yeah. know if I ever told you that, but I actually, I watch stand up all the time um, because I think there's something so riveting about going out there on stage. And it's one of the few, if not the only that I could ever think of activities or crafts or skill will you get like automatic feedback yeah and it's you're right it is so personal and because of that like i i've gotten up on stage and i've talked to literally like hundreds and thousands of people but you asked me to do a stand-up and i'm like (laughs) hell no like that is terrifying (laughs) it is terrifying to me so i find it interesting that you said that there's something about stand-up that's really personal but Mm -hmm. that one match that what you called the worst moment as, sure. as an athlete, what was personal expand more about what made it so personal on that one? Yeah. I mean, I think it was, it's a good question, but you know, why do some losses hurt more than others? Um, and man, how many times in my collegiate career and professional career did I win match point down? Did I come back after, you know, I had all these amazing moments of achievement or fight or positive attitude being rewarded. I, I can't even tell you any of those. I, I, I like maybe one of those I can remember, but this, the loss is just, they just personally hit so hard. I think the reason that one was so monumental was I was already feeling personally vulnerable in my life and like my decisions and how long does this go on? I was running out of money uh, and I didn't feel like I had much to show for it. I had raised money by selling shares of my professional career to investors. Um, And for $5,000, they could buy a portion of my pro tennis And there was a lot of people, a lot of my family friends that bought in and uh, it it added a little bit of the burden of responsibility to do well. By the way, they all were very proud of me and thought I was doing a great job. But it just when you lose a match that you're so obviously supposed to win, um, it just it all kind of felt like it was crashing down. Does that answer your question? It does. It brings up like this empty feeling, this like (laughs) nervous feeling in my stomach because I think... What is so unique about the game that we played is that it requires a lot of sacrifice, not just on the athlete, but oftentimes on the family as well, because yeah. it, it requires resources, financially, yeah. time, effort, sometimes a lot of geographical location moving. Mm-hmm. And so I think that the burden, if you will, or the weight on a tennis player is going to be a little bit different than maybe a football or basketball player. Not to say that those, but the the responsibilities and the weight is different. It might be the same. It might be different, but it's just different. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's true. And I know we've spoken about that with your family and um, I didn't have parents that were like checking in all the time on my results or upset if I lost. I, I openly joke now, like, I wish I had a little bit more of that. I could have been better at tennis. I would have had a better forehand for sure. But you think? But, um, well, look, there's a fine line between between the total hands on tennis parent mm-hmm. who gets, you know, the Richard Williams, so to speak. And the total insane parent that causes the kid to have a mental breakdown, but a little bit of pushing, a little bit of nudging, um, 
And I didn't feel the weight of my family sacrifice like some people would, but I just was really hard on myself, too, too hard on myself, you know, way mm-hmm. too hard. So how long after that match that you lost when you were up 5-1, did you retire? Well, when you get ranked what I was ranked, I don't even think they call it retiring. They call it quitting. Um, but uh, I, let's see, the when was that? It was probably four months. I was running out of money and you have a decision to make in individual sports like tennis. Golf is similar. It's like no team is picking me up. Prince Rackets was giving me rackets, but they're not giving me money. And it costs money. So what was I going to do? Like dip into my money that I didn't have? I couldn't ask my parents for money. They had already made it clear, like, you know, we'll help you raise some money, but we're not going to give you money for this. So it was decision time, you know, and I was out of money. And eventually I got offered the coaching position at University of Michigan, assistant coach. And that was a a natural and easy transition for me. Hmm. So when you lost that match, you had a feeling that this was yeah this was going to be one of your last and so i would imagine yeah. maybe whether you were uh you acknowledged it but at, at least on an unconscious level you knew that this was the beginning of the end for sure and that probably is what added to it right um and i remember going over to korea because i got into the main draw tournaments it they were easier to get into There was this idea that there'd be a a lot of opportunity there. And when you walk away from three straight weeks of three straight losses, one of which was a disaster, and you're like, this was supposed to be the kind of easy segment of tournaments, and you can't even you can't even figure that out. So what was the transition like from from tennis? You know, I I knew you're going to ask me that partially because that's the whole basis of this podcast. But uh it was, you know, it was, it was pleasant. It was welcomed. I was, I was ready to not be in Jeju Island, South Korea, looking for places to eat. I was ready to not string my own rackets. I was ready to not face ultimate loss every week. Um, do I wish I had more success? Do I wish I knew what it liked to play in a grand slam? Do I wish I knew what it liked to have car service at your tournaments? Yeah, of course. But man, it's a grind. It's like if 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 your listeners are wondering what it's like, Bull Durham is a good movie to watch <laughs> and and think and, and and you're not even with your teammates, you're alone. So yeah. um the opportunity to then coach at Michigan, which you know, playing at Duke, there's great resources, great people, equipment, clothes. You know, I was like, oh, this will be nice. So um it was an easy transition away from it, but I, I do have disappointments about it and wish it had gone better. Have you had someone on yet who, who, who's, whose transition was like, good, I'm happy. I'm out. (laughs) Everybody's probably, you know, what's hilarious. The, I haven't had a lot of tennis players on You're You're only the third tennis player on here. The first tennis player. And really for the longest time in my probably first 50 interviews, the one person that was like, I'm done. You know, can you guess who that was? I should have looked. He went your... to, he went to Saddlebrook with us, the tennis oh. Academy in Tampa, Florida. You weren't there when he was there, but he went through there. Well, then I won't, I won't know. I was going to say my, my initial no, thought I mean, would be Stephen last... Capriotti, but I was like, you no, know, that's a whole nother the, discussion. He was the last American man to win the U S open. Andy now I'm really going to put, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I've heard him talk about that in the in the Marty Fish documentary um, and, you know, feels like from what I've read about Andy, his dad was pretty intense. So I could I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I guess some of that makes sense to me. Yeah, I think it was it was a multitude of, of factors. Um, yeah. But I think, you know, it's funny because I when I ask you that question, you can just see your your wheels churning because yeah. it's like, how do you how do you answer what seems like a very straightforward, albeit open-ended question, but in a way where people can really understand it. Yeah. And I get it. Like it's, it's complex. Like it sounds like on one hand, you were really ready from a lifestyle perspective, but maybe from a personal and internal um, respect for the game and and where you were, the fact that you still have nightmares about this match. (laughs) Right you know, probably means that you, 
you know, the, the disappointment is also setting in as well. Like the yeah. grieving. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, grieving is a, is a dark word that, that we reserve often for death, but you can grieve all types of things. And, you know, my goal, I don't think I wrote it down, but when I was 10 was, I was supposed, I wanted to win every grand slam at least four times. Right. So when, mm-hmm. you know, it's not even like I got in a grand slam, you know, so it was just, there is a grieving process, whether it's fair, whether it's rational, whether it's accurate or not, it's the reality that, that you feel. And, um, and yeah, you know, and, and, and it, what it didn't go the way I wanted, but still all it did was set me up for so many other factors of life. It's helped me in so many other ways, but you don't always know that right when you're in there you know, uh, eating it, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and that's, um, wonderful insight because it is true. Like we often, when we think of grieving, we almost out of respect for people's other people's loss or our own yeah. losses, we kind of associate it with the death of a loved one, yeah. um, the death of a human being, but you're absolutely right. Because, you know, there's that old adage of every athlete dies twice. The first occurs upon retirement. And there's that loss of identity, the loss of purpose, the loss mm-hmm. of social support, mm-hmm. the loss of community. I mean, the list the list goes on and on and on. And so what was yeah. it about yeah. getting into comedy that you were drawn towards that? And what were the parallels between that and sports? There's a lot of parallels in particular with tennis. I mean, you're, that's the most common question I get when I do a comedy interview. They're always like tennis and comedy. How did that happen? And I'm like, well, if you really think about it, it's not that complicated. You're alone. You're solving problems. Um, you know, it's actually quite, you know, they, they are parallel. Um, I actually think through the course of time, I was meant to be doing comedy. And as a kid, I was very good at tennis and tennis almost, I didn't, I never saw a path for comedy. I, you know, you don't grow up like knowing, especially in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I'm from, knowing what the path and show business is. So um, I, I think I'm doing now what I'm meant to be doing. When I first did it, everything clicked um, just spiritually, emotionally, artistically. And I just happened to be very good at tennis. Um, and, you know, when you're good at tennis and you're a kid and you just get complimented so much, you get put on a pedestal, it starts to feel good. Uh, and that's the path I went. But um, you could you could say maybe that tennis got in the way of comedy. At least now that's the way I look at it. That is so fascinating that you <laughs> say it? that. <laughs> yes. Know. Well, I say that because only recently, literally within the past, I would say three to four months, that had I begun to start to uh, put all the different chapters mm-hmm. together in my life. At first, I saw tennis as just one chapter and it closed. Saw broadcasting, one chapter kind of closes. PhD, right. counseling. But then I was like, you know, sitting there in the client chair with my therapist, some stuff Mm -hmm. was coming up. Mm -hmm. And so I began to see it's like, what if tennis was actually just the beginning of my broadcasting and then the beginning of my mental health stuff? And what if like all the times that I had choked in broadcasting and in tennis, I am now finally learning how to become a champion and like make up for my time. So is that how, does that make yeah, any it's, sense? It's exactly right. And maybe, you know, in the biography that is prim, it's about clinical psychologist prim. And it's like the first chapter is about tennis, but at the time it's all that it, it's all you, you think your world is. And it's like, this mm-hmm. is so important that what happened to you happened to you so you can get to where you're going. And, you know, the, the, the most clear example to me when I started doing comedy was these older comics would say like, you know, I've noticed that you had a bad set last night, but then today you're just totally like out performing. You're not moping around. You have this kind of like, let's go, let's get going with it. And I remember that so many comics mentioned that to me and, you know, like, it never seems like these things bother you. And I was like, do you know how many tennis matches I've lost? And then you go (laughs) practice right after the match. I mean, it's just... And then I've started to think like, whoa, what if, what if oddly tennis was preparing me for comedy? That's the strangest thing I've ever said in my life. But 
And here's what's also exciting. Let's be optimists. What is comedy preparing me for next? What is mm. clinical psychology preparing Prim for next? That is, that's exactly what one of my mentors, Dr. William Parham, who's the current mental health director for the National Basketball Players Association. And I had several years ago, sat down with him and I said, I really believe this is my life purpose of becoming a psychologist, helping athletes beyond sport. And he goes in a very just simple, (laughs) uh, prophetic way was just like, I would be interested to talk to you in 10 years and see if that is still your life purpose. Interesting. And I it love that. was just kind of, it brought home the point that, yeah. hey, maybe we could have multiple life purposes along yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. And you, you've mentioned that word identity a lot. It is a big one for for athletes, especially in, in the United States where athletes are put on such pedestals and rewarded handsomely, you know, with for all different purposes. Um. And it is a loss. It is a, it is a grieving when your identity changes or moves. I mean, every change, my mom would always say with every change, there's loss, you know, there, you are losing Mm -hmm. that identity, but, but there's also gain. You're gaining a lot too with a new identity. Uh, But, but yeah, it's meaningful when all you've done all your life is practice, 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 win, 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 train, train, train. And now someone's saying, Hey, you're, you're, you're kind of not that thing anymore. What was the hardest part for you leaving tennis? I didn't realize some of these answers are going to be very simple. I didn't realize how much um, I appreciated and enjoyed my body, using my body physically as a tool. Like I love any now for me, the closest I can get to like the competitive high of tennis is when I'm in nature and I'm and I'm using the body strenuously, you know, skiing, running, um, uh, it's like something to be outside and to be, but it's, it's the heavy breathing. It's, it's like, I, I really love the physical part of tennis, you know, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's, and man, when you now with your life, I mean, what do you do? You just sit and podcast all day long. No, but, <laughs> but it's like, it's, you know, it's, you got to schedule an hour today. I'm going to schedule an hour to be active, you know, and, and, um, tennis was, I just so appreciated the fluidity of the sport that I got to, uh, indulge in every day, multiple times a day. Did you like the training aspect of it or did it, because, you know, some, some players and some, some tennis players and even some athletes, like they just, they hate practice. Yeah. I yeah. was somebody that like, I like you, I love the strenuous pushing specifically my mm-hmm. body, not necessarily my mind. I don't, right. I don't get off on like doing word puzzles on my phone. Yeah. Like some people really enjoy yeah. that cognitive, uh, engagement, but I like the physical aspect of the training. Um, but what were, what were you like? Did you enjoy practice or was it just the physical aspect? At college, I enjoyed the practices a lot, but as I've gotten to know myself better, I think that was because I was so embedded in a community. So many friends. These are my friends. We were like, what were friends were doing that day together? No, I didn't love hitting 600 forehand returns up down the line and then 600 cross. I did not enjoy that. I very much enjoyed the competition. I was a match, you know, player. I played my best tennis in matches and in the actual competitive moment. Coaches would always say like, well, you really surprised us because you haven't been practicing like that all week. Um, But... I don't have, I didn't have the love of tennis. I mean, you know, Rafael Nadal now talks so much about how much he just genuinely loves tennis. I wouldn't be surprised if some of that is trying to like trick himself into believing it, but I, I don't know how much I genuinely really loved the sport. I think it's an awesome sport and I, I love watching it now and, and knowing that I was good at it, but I don't know if I had this profound, deep love for the sport when I was playing. Fascinating. So you, but it was your favorite sport. Yeah. And I I like being good at it. Yeah. Is that shallow to admit? No, because (laughs) Paul Rabel, no, not at all. The most, he's known Paul Rabel, the most decorated lacrosse player uh, in the history of the sport was talking about this on another podcast. I I recently had him on. And so he talks about, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he talks about the how liking something can sometimes turn into 
your passion or being mm. very good at something could then turn into be your passion, whether and not necessarily vice versa, where your passion becomes something that you're good at. Because as we all know, sometimes those things don't match up. Like what I'm good at is not my yeah. passion. And it's yeah. not abnormal, like in doing and talking to so many athletes. The reason why I put that in that rapid fire of like, what's, what was your favorite sport growing up? Can't, you know, I would say maybe about 40% of the time, the sport that they yeah. first fell in love with is not the one that they ended up excelling at and becoming yeah. a professional athlete in. Yeah. So you're not, you're not, um, you're not an outlier. Well, yeah. And like, I loved, loved, loved hip hop. Um, wasn't good at it. <laughs> Didn't even know how to do it. Didn't know how to start. How do you even make a beat? How do I, you know, it's like also a lot of it goes into your community and your resources. You know, the tennis club was a three minute bike ride away. Um, uh, mm. I, I, I had Patrick McEnroe on my podcast, tennis, anyone podcast plug. And no. he was talking about his family and the swim club they went to had tennis courts. And one of the guys was like, hey, McEnroe's, why don't you join a clinic? Well, look how that changed that family's dynamic and path. Mm -hmm. um, so something as something as silly as just like proximity, uh, you know, changes so many things. And uh It'd be fun to talk to a lot of high achieving athletes and, and ask them like, where, you know, where, where, you know, wh why was it skiing? Why was it this? Why was it? And I bet you a lot of them be like, oh, it was down the street. Yes, you are absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that, you know, I'm going to get nerdy here, but in, please, for example, please. in my advanced development class, we talk about different theoretical models about different factors about human development and how that shapes somebody's trajectory. And so the more modern day um, frameworks are talking about context. And it's not just about environment. It's like culture, resources, financial resources, role mm -hmm. models, influences, time period. You mm -hmm. know, you talk about like Billie Jean King, like would she have been the person that she had become had it not been shortly after the civil rights movement and also the, right. the beginning of Title IX and all these other right. things. So you talk about the resources. Um, I mean, that obviously influenced your, your uh, gravitating towards tennis. Yeah. So do you think that you just happen to gravitate towards it because- were you very, were you prodigious as a young kid? Fa family tennis. We did family tennis. You know, we would go down to the park. My mom would pack a picnic. There's four kids, two parents. That's six. You could do a doubles. You could do a singles. I mean, it was a family activity. As you were talking about those different, um, you know, parts of uh, mm -hmm. proximity or whatever. I, I, I forgot what the words you said. You Context, said way, environment. Yeah, yes. Thank you. You know, I'm thinking back to, I'm the youngest of four kids. The struggle in my house was always getting mom and dad to pay attention to you. My parents were awesome, loving parents, but there's four. It was hard. I'm the youngest. I want mom and dad to pay attention to me. It's the 80s. SNL is crushing it. My dad would watch my dad laugh, laugh, laugh at Saturday Night Live. My mom would play Bill Cosby records. And now I'm seeing like, okay, comedy is a way to really get my parents' attention, you know? And my family teased a lot. That was like a, one of the ways we communicated. So, I, you know, we're talking about it with tennis, but I'm also thinking about it comedically. I'm, I live in Ann Arbor, a town that like really promotes the arts. There's a comedy club. There's always mm -hmm. comedians coming in. I mean, all these things are like brewing in the recipe that is me. And um, I'm also not surprised that here I am being a comedian. Maybe we really don't even have free will. Maybe it's just proximity, parental love and need. Oh man, Prim, it's getting dark. Is it dark or is it enlightening? <laughs> or is it enlightening? Right. It's enlightening. But it, it makes me feel like maybe we're just not on a track and we can't really get off the track. But um, but let's I like enlightening better than dark. <laughs> <laughs> I, or trippy. I mean, I think yeah. it's also super trippy to think yeah. about all those forces yeah. and how they were. So do you feel like tennis was a way to um, harness your skills and maybe also get the attention yeah, from your I think parents was, at the time yeah. being? Yeah, I think it was definitely, um, you know, I think I was good at it. And I think getting attention for being good at something I enjoyed. 
How simple is that? And it sa- doesn't sound sexy, but it, it might be the reality and, and that's okay. I definitely identify with that because yeah. I think for me, when I look back at my career in the beginning stages, when I started this show, I would often ask the question, did you choose a sport or did the sport choose you? Right. Because I think the beginning of the relationship and why somebody gets into sport really dictates their identity and their relationship with it. And also when they leave. So for me, I think that I agree. I think I learned to love it, but I also just kind of love what it offered me. And for me, it was not only just like, it gave me identity. It gave Mm -hmm. me a sense of validation, Mm -hmm. but it also gave me like a place to shine and kind of, and kind of going about what you talked about with comedy. I think I got into sports broadcasting because I always remember thinking like, I have something to say. I want to have a voice. I want to have a voice. And in, in my household, because of our upbringing, yeah. Asian cultural values, individual yeah. expression, not really encouraged or a thing. And so I wanted, to, I was like, I want my voice to be heard. Yeah. yeah. I think that steered me into sports yeah. broadcasting. So it's kind of like picking so some factors in your childhood it seems like that was kind of what drove you along the way too to comedy. For sure. I mean, if if you if you really have this burning urge to say something, you know, there's nothing no better place than stand-up comedy because there are no rules, you know. In the time <laughs> that I've been on TV, there's rules. There's things you can't say, yeah. there's bosses, there's writers, there's, there's, you know, for especially broadcast TV, there's advertisers that are like, no, 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 you can't say that. Um, I feel in, in comedy on TV, very limited in what I can say, but then stand up, man, they give you a microphone and they elevate you and they tell everyone to shut up and they say, go. I mean, it's like, now the challenge is you got to try to be funny, but uh, <laughs> yeah, if you're itching to say more, come join me with the comedy clubs. Let's go. No, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> my my ability to choke on stage is already like I'm already. Yeah. No, I don't need yeah. to. I've already made myself look like a fool many times over the course of my career. I don't need another opportunity to make that even more so. And you'll do and more even explicit. more, and it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you and I, I want to make sure we continue our conversation because mm-hmm. from when we caught up uh, a couple of months ago, I feel mm-hmm. I've noticed that like sometimes if I catch up with somebody, especially if it's an old friend, mm-hmm. like I don't incorporate that into the show. It's like I continue sure. on with it. But kind of tying that in, you know, you and I were at Saddlebrook. So we only overlap for six months. Is that but all it was? The, yeah, because you were there wow. your senior year, right? Yeah. You said only for a semester. Junior, junior year. Yeah, it was only six months. And anyone who's listening knows Prim is one of these people that you know for six months, but you feel like you've known forever. She just is Aww. like that. It's true, though. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I haven't talked to you in many, many years, but as soon as the, the phone buzzes, I'm like, it's Prim. And I'm like, you know, it's so funny. So <laughs> you also have a great, Aww. you know, have a name that not a lot of people have. Me, I yeah. I text people and they're like, it's Michael. Uh, which Michael? <laughs> I've got 10 Michaels in my phone. So Costa. That's why yeah, I call Costa, you Costa. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's better. Yeah. Um, but so we overlapped for mm-hmm. six months. But during that time... I, I, well, obviously, I mean, you know, we didn't get to know each other super, 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 super well, but Mm -hmm. I I would have never guessed that you would have gotten into comedy, but because you were, you were funny, that's for sure. And you were a jokester, but you, it's not like you were the class clown. I don't remember. Yeah. I mean, most comics would probably not be identified as class clown. Class clown is, is kind of disruptive act out usually lowest hanging fruit, although I've certainly told those jokes. <laughs> I, you know, I for yeah, you, you know, I think there is a misconception that the comedian is the class clown. It's normally kind of the quieter kid who um, bides his or her time, uses words to their advantage, uh, analyzes and observes the situation and finds its weaknesses or loopholes. That's usually the stand-up comic. You have to keep going because I, I do think that there's a lot of misconceptions about the understanding. Yeah. And from a psychological perspective, I'm very fascinated about just yeah. the general comedian population because, you know, you have a lot of, I think people, will, the the general population would go up to a Kevin Hart when he's walking around ESPN. It's like, oh, say something funny. Right. And it's like, it right. doesn't really work like yeah. that. And they're also, yeah. many of them are, 
introverted. And yet when they get on stage, it's like the place that they feel most comfortable in front of everybody. So yeah. Get into the psyche of of what it's like to be a comedian. It is, it is strange. And you're right. You know, everyone who's listening, don't go up to a comedian and say something funny, you know, just go talk to the comedian. I bet once both of you warm up, something funny will come up. Uh, But there's nothing, nothing worse. It'd be like going up to Michael Jordan and be like, dunk, you know, or like, you know. (laughs) <laughs> you know, show me your golf swing or something, you know, so I, I, and I, by the way, I bet you idiots do that. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, there isn't there. There is a lack of education in the whole mm-hmm. world, particularly United States, about comedy and what it is. And it's a broad term. Stand up comedy is different than sketch comedy. Sketch is Saturday Night Live. Im- improvised comedy is like the Second City. There's the comedy when your neighbor falls down her stairs and she's okay. That's, you know, everyday uh, unintentional comedy. Stand up comedy, what I do is a performance. It's an exaggeration of a uh, multiple or singular parts of my personality. Um, it is meant, in my opinion, it is meant to be, hey, come here, buddy. Somebody's wondering who I'm talking who to. This Aww. is Walter. Did you meet Walter last time? No. What's I up, probably, Walter? Walter, he can't hear you because I'm wearing my headphones. Oh, but that's he doesn't true. like he doesn't like when I talk to other people. There you go, buddy. Okay, oh, he wants your that. attention. Yeah, but he just got it. So I see. I see the similarity there. You wanted attention. You got a dog that wants attention. Totally. totally. I got it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. A lot yep. of replication there. <laughs> <laughs> the relationship. It's true. It's true. Uh, so stand up comics. Uh, are very self-conscious, usually socially awkward, but then they still have this weird need to communicate and have everyone listen to them. So it's a complex group. It's a group very susceptible to depression. It's a group that struggles with depression and addiction. Um, most likely, I believe, I'm generalizing, but you know, there goes yeah. my, it's okay. Walter just knocked my, you okay, buddy? <laughs> Stu, this is great. This is like working from home classic. Um, and <laughs> you go hang out in a, with a group of stand-up comics. It's not super fun. If anything, you're like, geez, can we get some life into this thing? Cause they're just kind of moping around, uh, looking at their feet lots of times. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there's, a lot, why, there's a lot there. Yeah. Because I'm, so what is, what, why, why is stand-up and that personality like that? Can you just explain the art of it? And why there's that self-conscious attribute, yeah. the the maybe tendencies. Um, at, of course, we're talking like generally speaking course, and anecdotally, but why? But it does seem like this particular population, this specific group of com- uh, comedians, there might be some mental health issues associated For with sure. it, including like the addiction. For sure. I mean, over COVID, I I would say you know, fifteen to twenty comics that I knew wouldn't say close friends, but I mean, died, you know, suicide, Mm -hmm. addiction, reckless behavior. uh, It's really wild. I think if you can reverse engineer it, it's that the feeling you get when it goes well, um, fulfills all voids, you know, it, it fulfills any pain, any self-consciousness. It is, it is like drugs, you know, if I could admit that that's happened in my life too. And, And, um, there is a draw to that feeling, you know? So Mm -hmm. why I, I, I understand why comics seek that out. What I don't know Mm -hmm. is, you know, where does that hole or void come from? And in my life, there's nothing massive. I just think, um, I always looked for mom and dad's attention. Do I need more than other kids? I don't know. That's what I don't know. Or was I just in a busy household? I don't know. And also I can guarantee I, about my family, the way we said, I love you in my family was, we, was we made jokes. It wasn't a big, mm. I love you. I love you family. It was a, if they weren't making fun of you, they didn't, they didn't notice you. They, they didn't love you. So that was, you know, mix that into me. And, and here we are. Come here, buddy. You yeah. can sit on my lap. You can sit on my lap. Come here. That's a lot of, that's super, super insightful. And I feel like you've it seems like you've done a lot of work in terms of just re- really making those connections because those are really deep connections, including like the expression of love and right. how we tend to kind of like replicate that. And so if that's always been like the language of love in your family, yeah. and then now that's just kind of what you do as well, you probably have a sense of like nostalgia 
or a, a close relationship with that language yeah. of love. Um, yeah. But more importantly, you know, I'm I'm definitely I'm sorry for your loss. That is, that's really you know that's really sad. And and thanks. It it it, know, it wasn't. It was a lot of. Per- peripheral friends, so to speak, mm-hmm. but it was so many that it was, wow. It was like, wow, this is our community. This, and this is happening more than, and then by the way, every, there's been extreme loss in all communities the last couple of years, but it really felt like the stand up world. Holy shit, man. I get yeah. frustrated by it. I'm like, guys and girls, like, you know, probably the wrong reaction. I want to be like, psh, 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 get your shit together. Stop going out seven nights a week, drinking every night. Stop, you know, eat healthier, wake up earlier, drink more water. But, you know, that's just me being like a dad or something. I don't know. Well, I hope this is not kind of going off the the railroad tracks a little bit, but I think it is. It, it's kind of, you know, we're talking about the intersection of sport and what we do and our mm-hmm. passions and transitions and making sure we're making the right transitions in life. So kind of going off of that addiction, that's something that's like really, I mean, it hit me with a ton of bricks. A couple of weeks ago, uh, long story short, you know, this yeah. year I'm I'm externing at the VA hospital, and yeah. I did that because I was like, okay, maybe I want to learn about this veteran population because I think I could apply some of these things mm-hmm. to the athlete population. Mm-hmm. What I had totally forgotten was that I'm in the substance abuse rehab treatment program. So mm-hmm. the salient topic is not necessarily their their stories of war. Of course, that mm-hmm. will come up, but it's all about addiction, and wow. then it made me think about the people from our tennis academy. I know that you you were only yeah. there for six months, but yeah. I think I shared that with you, you know, yeah. like a few days later, but I mean, that number I've lost, we've lost three people in yeah. seven or eight months, four yeah. people in two years. And that number gets higher. Um, you know, yeah. once you expand it out to seven, eight over the past decade or so. Yeah. So it makes me wonder, are, is a certain type of person going to, stand-up comedy, going to this tennis academy environment because they, they identify that, that, that it fits their personality more rather than Mm -hmm. the environment and being in stand-up or being in this tennis academy Mm -hmm. has that effect on us. It's like this interactional relationship. I think that's a good question. And it, you know, or is the country just have a problem with addiction and it's, it's affecting all communities. I mean, I I think that'd be more a question for you, for you to answer for, but you know, military, you got, there must be a rush. There must be a big rush there at certain moments. Mm -hmm. Tennis Academy. There's nothing like the competitive rush, stand up comedy. There's nothing like the performance rush. So maybe working backwards, maybe the, they seek out this thrill that feels, that fulfills them for a second. I'm putting myself in that category too. Yeah. I don't know, just thinking out loud, but it it definitely is something that we as a society, we need to learn more about. We need to be studying. Mm-hmm. We need to know how the brain works. I feel like we don't know shit about the brain. Come on, Prim, let's get on the brain. I know I am on that brain. Actually, get on the brain. Well, I can tell you right now, <laughs> um, I can tell you right now that out of all the communities I've been a part of, Missouri, Tampa, Duke, ESPN, media, blah, 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 I've, I've lost, I, I, I haven't even come close to experiencing the amount of not just mental health issues, dysfunction, disorders from this particular period of my life, the Tennis Academy. And that's not, that's not to blame the Tennis Academy that we went to. It could have been just a period of time you know, um, but I've, I've experienced more loss from that group than any other area of my life. So, um, that's very interesting. And when I was at Saddlebrook, I remember thinking, man, these are some rich kids and their parents just ship them over here. You know, yeah. now that wasn't everybody. I, mm-hmm. I met a lot of people, yourself included that like the parents were there or they had really, you know, solid foundations and they were there strictly for tennis, but man, on the outside looking in, you're going, one of the kids was driving a Ferrari. Remember he was like 16 years old or something. And you're like, come on. Yeah. I don't (laughs) even remember who it was. I just remember Abu Dhabi. (laughs) Yeah. And my, my dad wouldn't let me like have a tape player in my bedroom. You know what I mean? It's like, (laughs) what do you think? Let's get the joke, Walter. Walter, what's going on? He doesn't, he doesn't seem very entertained by what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so When's the last time you had that so-called nightmare about that match? (laughs) 
Over COVID, I wrote a lot and uh, it came up, you know, it, it came up. It's been a while. I mean, I've got a family and a daughter and I have a lot of a lot of things make me smile throughout the day. One of them just left. Walter, he hates this podcast. Um, you know, I feel I, I feel fulfilled and happy and challenged in so many different ways, but it creeps in. It creeps in. I mean, when was the last time? It was probably five or six months ago. And I just remember I, I had a dream and I was I was up 5-1 and I was leaving the changeover and I was getting ready to serve. You know, and it's like it just slipped into some dream and then it was gone. But I woke up and I remember saying like, holy shit, that goddamn match was in my head. You know, <laughs> it's like, and I'm like, imagine missing free throws to like lose the NBA finals or something. But maybe it's the same. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's this. The feeling is the same. I don't know. But um I'm okay with it. We got to, I have to embrace the good, the bad, the ugly and everything. Cause that's human. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying Maybe. that. I don't actually believe that. I'm just saying that, but. Yeah. You don't actually believe it. Well, I mean, you kind of, it is true though, yeah. whether or not you believe it is another yeah. story, but I mean, I, I guess I asked that because it is so interesting. Cause I, there was a period when I was literally dreaming about tennis mm -hmm. almost every single day. So right. wow. that was back in 2017. Is that when you, when you came back? I did. I yeah. did because, yeah. you know, and depending on what you believe in and all this stuff, but over the past, like I would say eight years or so, I became extremely spiritual. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I am a firm believer that whether it's conscious or unconscious, sometimes our dreams are really there telling us a message, which is why I pose that question to you. I find it interesting that it's, that dream, you still dream about it, you know, yeah. even five, six months ago is like really recent. So what I yeah. surmised from that period when I was at ESPN at the time, I was every single night, whether I was choking or winning, I was dreaming about tennis, mm. but eventually I, I eventually came to the realization with my therapist that much of my continuing issues and struggles in life was because it was so wrapped up in how I ended my career and that mm. prompted my right. comeback. Right. So a little backdrop of like why I, you know, it may not necessarily be connected to tennis, but have you ever thought about the meaning of that match and why, what message might be coming from it as it creeps into your dreams? Yeah, I mean, um, Noah Rubin is a, is a tennis player who has that Instagram called Behind the Racket. And have you seen that? And you kind of tell a yeah. quick story. Usually it's one of perseverance or adversity. And I remember he asked me to do it and I did that match. And as I was sitting there contemplating it, it was a very odd day. I was like on The Daily Show that day and I had 30 minutes between rehearsal and I was sitting there in my Daily Show suit going over the jokes. And I was like, oh shit, I got to do this Noah thing. And I sat there and I contemplated tennis, like in the offices of the daily show dressed as a comedian. And it was all very like worlds, you know, cr crashing yeah. into each other, but it was fun. But the gist of all that was that I felt so alone that day. I was so alone. I was traveling with somebody and we weren't getting along <laughs> And I'd been on the road forever and I just, I remember reaching out to my family, but it was in Korea and the time, and I just felt so alone. And I think part of that match was trying to avoid the pain of loneliness or that's part of the reason that it, and I'm, I'm, I would have answered this to you sooner had I remembered, but I think that was part of it, that that was, that was part of it. So maybe now yeah. Freud, um, maybe I'm, when I'm hitting that, match in my brain, maybe there's some feeling of loneliness or being alone at that point. I don't know. I think that's spot on because I think that there's something about. I feel like I'm crushing this podcast. No, you are. I feel crushing like, I feel this like podcast. people are in their car right now and they're like, Costa is a great guest. <laughs> Why do you, I'm just I mean, I... <laughs> I'm just making a joke. No, I mean, but there's no, go finish there your thought, truth? finish, finish your thought, finish your thought. Is there not some truth into that in every joke? But yeah, yeah I mean, sure. I think that the aspect about tennis is that it's a really, really lonely sport. I mean, it you is. know, people make fun of tennis players. Like my husband will laugh at me. He's like, y'all are so weird. Like you just yeah. talk to each, you just talk to yourself yeah. all the time. But it's like, you have to, because yeah. 
It's a sport where you can't get coaching. I mean, the rules have changed, but generally you can't get coaching. You don't have teammates. You don't have an assistant coach. Even if you get injured, you kind of have to play PT to Mm -hmm. yourself a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to like, whether it's like talking out aloud and all this other stuff. So that's me just like validating um, for the longest time. Like I like being alone was like a, a trigger thing for me, even today as, as you know, I'm 41 years old. So you think that, that when that loneliness comes up, do you think it's coming up in periods where it's like reminding you of like, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, sometimes at work and TV and then different times, different jobs, you'll be surrounded by people and you'd be surrounded by um, producers and writers. But then sometimes you're like, am I all alone out here? Like I'm the, am I the only person that's thinking this or, you know, the joke to me is here. Why is everyone telling me to do something different? And, you know, everyone in their life, doesn't matter how many people are around, you can feel alone. So it's possible. It's possible that that dream is my, hey, Michael, you're feeling alone dream. Hmm. Hmm. So then how Man, do you fulfill it? I don't know, you know. Um, because living in New York city, which you and I, you know, are in and around, <laughs> it is the busiest place on earth. And it's the weirdest thing. You could be surrounded by thousands of people. And it could be, you know, you catch catches you on the wrong day. You could feel like the loneliest person in the world, even though you're jam packed in a sardine can. You can absolutely hide in anonymity in New York city. It's wild. Mm-hmm. And then where, where I'm from in Michigan, you know, you can't drive down the driveway without the whole neighborhood being like, oh, Michael's back in town. You know, it's like they all know <laughs> everything. They see everything. They know when you mowed your lawn. They know when the garbage guy came. It's like so, I, you know, I also think it's OK. It's OK if I feel a little alone and I have a dream about a match I blew and we wake up and, you know, my daughter wants to play puzzles with me and it, it gives the day complexity. It, it's a good reminder Oh shit. I, I have people in this house. I have people who love me. That's nice. Um, and it's good to be reminded sometimes of that. Also, I remember being at those tournaments, the futures tournaments and looking and seeing men who were 10 years, my senior signing up for practice courts, making $111 a day. And I remember thinking, that's not what I want to do. You know, I, I, I don't want to yeah. be that guy. So I made a decision to bounce and to try something different. And I'm not that. And I, and it's worked out for me. So you got to remember all that stuff, but, yes. um, but we don't always. Yes. Yes. A different question about that okay. is okay. what have you learned from that moment about choking? How do you process choking, choking today in the work that you do? The best, <clears throat> the best understanding of choking I got excuse me, was from, I think one of Rick Pitino's books, which I don't know where he is now. Didn't he have sex with some intern and get fired? I don't know what's going on with him, (laughs) but I liked, yeah. yeah, Okay. I don't know, but, um, I don't know if that's true. So whatever, but, uh, it was that the, 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 the next step after choking was success. Like you did all of this, you did all the difficult steps. You got right to the edge and you, and you just made a small mistake. And, I like that because it gave me the idea of like, hey, we we basically got there. We just didn't really tie the the ribbon on the on the package, but that was the easiest way for me to digest it. But man, choking is tough. Oof, because I was an effort guy. I was a comp- every point you compete guy. I would see some of my peers who would lose the first set and kind of tank the second, pretend like they didn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, oh, I went out the night. This is why I always hated Nick Kyrgios. You know, it was like, oh, I went out the night before because you're just removing this personal stakes because you're afraid of choking. You're afraid of losing. I wasn't that way. I I still get mad at comics who do this. They bring the notebook on stage. They kind of shrug it off. And it's like, oh, don't pretend like this isn't important to you. Of course it's important to us. Um, so it hurts. It really does hurt. And, um, Man, you get, you know, if I could go back, I guess I would just try to really work mentally on just letting things go and just having a short memory and going to the next, but it's hard. It's, it's very hard to do that. But it sounds like you, you do do that because that's what a lot of your peers highlight about you right. is like, wow. So you, so maybe it, you know, maybe I did it. Do, do you, maybe yeah, I learned. are you a better, are you, do you feel like you're a better closer now? In that sense of like, when you're so close to an opportunity, when you're so close to uh, a said goal or, or mm-hmm. whatever it is. I mean, I like, felt like I was a good closer as a tennis player. Mm. You know, 
I felt like, man, give me, give me the, give me the balls. Let's serve. I can serve this thing out. And I have a million times. It's just, maybe that was also part of it. Part of my identity may have been that I was a closer and then I blew it. Five, five, <laughs> one Korea, Jeju Island. Do you set. remember the name? <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't pretend like you don't remember Prim. Some of the matches. I mean, I'm, uh, you're asking the wrong person. I just, uh, I'm not one of those athletes that like remembers, um, that remembers all all those little details. I am somebody that remembers the feeling of it. I do remember when I choked in, uh, our ACC regular season match against Wake Forest, we snapped as like, we had won 13 consecutive ACC regular season titles and conference championships. And my team and my choke was part of the movement that snapped yeah. that 10 yeah. year, 15. Yeah. So yeah. I remember I, I do, yeah. I really do. Yeah. But I think the reason why I'm, the reason why I'm to tie it all together, please, please that, do. <laughs> the reason why I was like, you're like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> stop, stop. I promise I'm not psychoanalyzing you. It's more just like, in-depth questioning because sure. I love the meaning. I love the meaning of sport and how it prepares mm-hmm. us for the next chapter. I think mm-hmm. your journey is like so emblematic of it. And so like you talked about, yeah, even though you have these dreams, like maybe it's the reminder of just like you are a closer and you you have been able to bounce back and you did bounce back. And maybe it just gives you just enough chip on your shoulder. Yeah to keep push pushing you yeah. forward. Like, would you be where you are? Had you not felt a little, just like chip on your shoulder? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, that's definitely true. And the other thing is it's like, who knows if that other guy who was down five, one and turned around and one is on some podcast in Korea right now being like <laughs> greatest match of my life. <laughs> you know, I came back. I, I, when I was Michael on this, Costa. yeah, when I was on, exactly when I was on, um, this Fox sports show called crowd goes wild and Regis mm-hmm. Philbin was with, but I became friends with Trevor price who won two super bowls with the Broncos or the Ravens I think it was the Broncos. I don't know. Anyways, he was a defensive lineman. His job was to stop the running back. And he would always say, you know, they pay the running back also like his job is to get past me. And it was always like such a wonderful reminder. Like both parties are paid a lot of money to do their job. And sometimes yeah. this guy stops them. And sometimes this guy runs around. I mean, it's like, here I am dreaming about this match. Well, what if the other guy is like, that's the greatest match I ever played in my life. You know, it's like, shit, I don't even think about that. Huh. That's interesting. Do you think your answer will change if I bring you back onto the show five years from now? Do you think you'll have a different answer about that match, that so-called nightmare? I hope in five years. Well, first of all, yes, I will. I will redo your podcast. Um, <laughs> but I hope. I think the next five years is going to be filled with so many um, fun and interesting challenges that I I I feel like the tennis memories are getting diluted and less and less <laughs> over time. And and guess what? I'm okay with that. I'm very okay with that. And. Um, it would be detrimental if I was like still staying awake over the match I lost in Korea at five, one, you know, I think it makes me a complete person. And what I hope to teach my daughter is, you know, shit, like you gotta have those matches. You gotta blow those moments. I don't, you don't even, she's two and a half. I don't know if she's going to play tennis or whatever, but Mm -hmm. those, those make up who we are. So I hope in five years when I redo your podcast, but by then it'll probably be on TV or whatever you want it to be. <laughs> I hope that we can talk about a different match or a different, you know, thing. Cause it won't be as important to me. Last question, wrapping it up. Come what on. would you, what would you tell your, how old were you then? 24? I was probably maybe? 23, 24. Yeah. What would you have told the 23, 24 year old Michael Costa who had just stepped off that off the court after that? After loss? losing that? What would you, what would you tell them just about tennis and the future? I would uh, say, Hey dude, um, you're going to be a professional comedian on TV every day. So who gives a shit about this match? Bye. Go get drunk. Have fun. See ya. But don't get too drunk. No, I mean, I mean, I, I, I would say like life is so, you know, it is so 
wonderfully complex and moves in different directions and you're going to end up where you didn't expect or believe and it's going to be great and uh uh it's okay man so the moral of the story is is that maybe sport is just the beginning and when it ends it's actually mm. propelling you into your 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 what you're what you're meant to be yeah yeah, but man, is it a complicated beginning then? It really is. Yeah. It really is. Costa, thank you so much for coming on the show and dealing with all my weird I'm trying to, philosophical... I'm trying, to shake your, I'm trying to shake your hand. High five. Are we not high at five. the high five? You're going to shake my hand? <laughs> I don't know. Who shakes people's hands anymore? I'm so glad you have this pod. What a cool pod that's not just celebrating the athlete's achievements or records or numbers, but actually getting into the nitty gritty of what happens next. It's great. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Uh, Costa, where can we find you? MichaelCosta.com. I'm blowing up on TikTok. I know <laughs> oh, wow. I know your, your listeners are big TikTok fans, but I know it's owned by the Chinese government. But uh, <laughs> follow me on TikTok and Instagram. I'm, I tour all the time. I'm on The Daily Show. And uh, thank you for having me, Prem. Tennis podcast. Don't forget your tennis podcast. Oh, yeah. Tennis Anyone podcast is available right wherever you listen to podcasts. Really hope you enjoyed today's conversation. For more episodes, just visit our homepage on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. And to watch the full version of these interviews, you can just head on over to YouTube and search for the show name, The Next Chapter with Prims Ripapat. Subscribe to us, like us, give us a star rating because we really appreciate you listening and also showing your support. The Next Chapter with Prim Saripapat is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.